Gemini 28, a man declared bankrupt. On the face of it, we're discussing failure here. And the spiritual understanding is that there is no such thing. Failure is a construct. It, it all depends where you end the story as to whether or not somebody seems to be a success or a failure. Because anyone who's in a very successful position, President of the United States, for example, you wait a little bit longer and he's an ex-president. <laughs> um, the story changes according to time and uh, failure becomes success later, success becomes failure later on the face of it. But these words are irrelevant. They're, they're just false. There is no such thing as either success or failure. And the idea that there, we could fail in society's eyes is quite a strong one. And it motivates us to behave in a certain way, to avoid that at all costs. And yet, if we were to detach ourselves from the heavily burdensome emotionality around the question, we would see that the processes of trial and error, which is the only process actually through which we can learn and grow and evolve, includes the word error. <laughs> and it's very foolish indeed to think that a life without apparent failure is going well. It kind of suggests that there's no reaching up. I remember a very arrogant man. He was arrogant on behalf of his, his son's success. He, he was saying his son was like amazing and so on. And like, in the end, I got tired of this. And I, I just, he, 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 the last thing he said was uh, his son has got every job he ever went for. And I said, oh, he's not very ambitious then. And this was a slap into, in the face to this arrogant father. He said, what do you mean? He's getting good, important jobs. I said, yeah, but he's getting them all, isn't he? He's under underreaching. He's not punching his full weight. And he was quite distraught at my interpretation. But there you have it. Unless you actually are willing to miss the target, to be in error, to fail, well, then you're just not going high enough in your, 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 your visionary aspirations. It's because we reach above our current station that we sometimes have disappointments and needs for correction. And that's a, basically what karma is. Karma is not a punishment. It's just an opportunity to correct a misunderstanding. The course direction has to change. You know? So karma is our opportunity to do that. And it's certainly not the case that um, were, were punished by any agency at all. Who, who would it be? God, the punisher? It's nonsense. Um, the devil, the punisher. Well, I don't get it. I mean, because punishment and correction leads us to a better sense of self and God. So why would the devil want to do that, to move us closer to God? Why would anyone want to? And the, who is it that punishes us? And here's the answer, that the, the punisher is the one who knows they have not faced up to their own shortcomings. Those are the only people that punish us, the ones that cannot self-control, self-measure, self-correct. These are the ones in government. And you take a typical policeman. You know, they're, they're bullies, aren't they, typically? I'm not saying all of them. There's some lovely policemen, especially where I live. But the typical policeman is a bully. And um, that's because they haven't looked at their own emotional process. So the whole business of defeat and failure and karmic repercussions and punishment is, is just a false understanding. We need error in order to have our course correction. And the true optimist will celebrate apparent failure in this way when blocked from their chosen direction they'll realize that something better is on the horizon because that's what it's for we're blocked in a certain direction because it's just not good enough there's better that's why we're blocked and so the true optimist seeing apparent failure, looks around 
for opportunities that have not been noticed before. We focus on the silver lining when we see a cloud. Not the cloud and then be released by having a silver lining, which is what the teaching goes. Every cloud has a silver lining, but it starts with the word cloud. Um, every silver lining is announced to us by the presence of a cloud. Look at it that way around. By silver lining, what I mean is light that's emergent. That's what a silver lining is. It's emergent light. So light announces itself as emerging into our being by bringing out a cloud. That's its herald. That's the announcement of the coming of, of additional light. And we do need to defend ourselves from the intensity of light. Without the cloud, we, we just couldn't handle the light. It is just too much for us. So the cloud is what dulls the light and dims the light and shields us from the light in order that we can then just recalibrate ourselves, change our mind, change our attitude, change our behaviors, and, and make ourselves open to this new powerful dispensation of light. Because if we didn't do that, if we didn't have the failures, the errors, the, the blockages, we wouldn't bother. We, we couldn't bother. We need the grit of apparent failure in order to bother, in order to, to rise and refine ourselves and become the receiver, the, the, the receptacle, the proper um, agency through which this new dimension of light can, can come into the world. So now we see it entirely differently. If we're made bankrupt in one direction of purpose, we look around for that light which so far we have not yet been ready to assimilate. And we look around in such a way that we actually learn and evolve and become more subtle in our understandings and wiser in our con concepts. And, and, and as we do that, then there's this manipulation, shall we say, this, this handling of our energy field and, and tuning it up so that we can then take on the, the greater light. And then we expand into that light and, and we create with that light. And this creative activity is also important to consider. It is taught that um, necessity is the mother of invention. In other words, if there's a problem, we have to become creative in order to deal with it. And if we were not given a problem, then we would not optimize our creativity. This is the concept. And we will only have to look at wartime to know that this is true. In, in a rather sinister way, perhaps, but nevertheless, during wartime when needs must, creativity is at its highest in the level of survival and military prowess and, and, and inventions and things. And when war is no longer with us, then that creativity is rechanneled into art and beauty. So there's this waveform of, of creativity that moves from useful and practical and coping with life on the one hand when disaster is, strike, is, is threatening and um, self-expression, emotional release on the other when, when we're free of that. But what, what the main point is that until we're actually challenged, we don't really do our best, um, creatively speaking. And, you know, look at your own life. Just look back at what you actually did to overcome the problems that you came up with. You grew, you evolved, you became creative, you looked around for solutions, and you became more of yourself, a, a better version of it. Albeit it was an uncomfortable process, Learning mostly is, I would say, um, halfy, halfy, really. I mean, we, we learn a lot through play, and yet we do learn a lot through overcoming problems. Now, it's also worth men mentioning that usually bankruptcy 
is tem a temporary issue. The community eventually forgives people in debt. They used to be put in prison, but not today. Bankrupts are actually released if they are willing to have another go and, and, and show signs that they're actually correcting their errors of, of, of behavior. And, um, and we see here, although it's institutionalized and cold, we see the evidence of humanity and compassion. The community actually tries to take care of people rather than punish bankrupts very badly by putting them into prison. They're, they're just explaining, look, you, that doesn't work. You can't do it that way. You need to mend your ways and, and then we'll give you another try. And, and, and so there's this institutionalized compassion operating. And we come to see that the whole question of success and failure is, is not really anything to do with measurement of position and money and so on. It's actually to do with how well we are in relationship like as a community in this forgiving sense of bankrupts, but also in a wider sense. Are we forgiven our errors by the people that we have in our lives? And do we forgive them? Do, do we measure the quality of our relationship with somebody according to their levels of success and failure or ours? No, we don't. What we do is we just hope that there's a convergence of relationship. And if there is, then all is well.